Hello, everyone. My name is Manan Ahmed. Um, I teach at Columbia University in the history department. Um, and I am honored uh, to be one of the board members at um, Asian American Writers Workshop, which is a organization since 1991 that has been dedicated to telling Asian American stories, emphasizing the lives of Asian Americans as migrants, as women, as people of color, as a Muslim, as uh, queer and trans and how and countercultural in it, their affect countercultural and the resistances that they have offered um, with their with their um, activism, with their poetry, with their artwork, and of course with their words. And so it is from that spirit of uh, resistance of countercultural movement that we began to think about a conversation mm -hmm. um, with uh, Jaffrey Nuddin, who's the executive director, and Lily Philpot, who is. Uh, part of the media uh, team at AAWW to have this uh, gathering called Radical Thinkers and have a conversation about some of the people who um, I guess are uh, thinking in radical different ways and doing um, work from that perspective. I am an interloper <laughs> in the sense that I'm not going to claim radicalness, uh, but my, my conversation partner today is Shazia Sikandar, who indeed is uh, a radical in all, all sense of the word. And it's it's been an honor to think with her for the last couple of days in anticip anticipation of this, this conversation. Um, and and to, to, to call attention to her um, amazing new solo show in New York, which we will talk about in great detail soon. But before we get to all that, I want to say a couple of words about Shazia's, um, I guess Shazia through, through what I saw and experienced. So I went to graduate school in um, University of Chicago. And at some point, 97, 98, 99, Shazia will correct me. There was a show that, um, that had Shazia's work. I mean, Shazia came to the campus with this work. And at the show, the, there was an individual who, um, who was introducing, et cetera, et cetera, and who I had taken a class with. And um, the pointed out that, you know, she's, she's from Lahore and, and was trained at NCA and how amazing and radical it is that someone from there is now, uh, you know, at University of Chicago. And, and that was the first time that I was actually connected in the sense that I'm also from Lahore. I also grew up there. I also went to college right around the same time. So we, we met, I guess, briefly um, earlier, a couple of years ago, maybe, uh, before COVID, however many hundred years is that. Uh, but, but, but I wanted to start with Lahore because, you know, like I said, we, we have Lahore in, in common. So tell me, tell me where, where did you grow up in Lahore and what was it like back then? And tell me something about Lahore. Yes. You're Lahore. Yes, 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 absolutely. So I was, um, I, you know, I grew up in Lahore and so mostly it's the eighties. Mm all sort of turmoil and the engagement with art, I think uh, what pushed me into art is probably the Ziaul Huck's period in yeah. its unfolding yeah. in one's consciousness as a young individual. Because I was at the Canadian College for Women, you know, just sort of hanging there <laughs> like many other women, <laughs> figuring out, okay, what is next? 
And at that time, art was not on the table. I was always interested in art and could paint and draw and was something, a very intimate space for me growing up as a very introverted child. It, it gave me a sense of freedom and fantasy and you know all of that. So I never for once thought that I could actually pursue art in a, in a more responsible manner. And I, um, I was, I, I, I ran into, I, I don't recall how I met, but the late artist Lala Roch. Mm -hmm. And at that time she was running an organization also called the Seymour, a women's publication resource. And I, I think I did a internship there or worked with her. And then she also was instrumental in pushing me or apply to this National College of Arts. <laughs> and at that national, you know, in those times, it, it just seems so ridiculous now, but say like 85, it, NCA has its own reputation. It wasn't a place where uh, the way NCA 15 years later becomes where many, you know, many Pakistanis from, from different uh, economic backgrounds and different regional areas are, are flocking to. So, so I remember how hard that was for me to um, argue with my parents to let me go to the National College of Arts. Mm -hmm. And I think initially it was on the premise that perhaps I would study architecture. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so that's, that's the time when you were at the, at the Lahore College. Absolutely. So, you know, you have, um, look, it is, there, there's something about growing up in a dictatorship, right? In a dictatorship that has, um, that militarizes thought, right? So it tells you as a young person that, you know, you, so one of the slogans that I remember Ziaul Haq had was Marde Momin, Marde Haq. And, you know, the man of, man of faith, the man of truth. And the whole idea was that you conform. And you become, you join the military. So my, as a man, as a male, my, the idea for my family was give, as soon as I reach, you know, the age of uh, 16, I will sit for the uh, ISSB, the military induction exam, and I'll be shipped off to become a military officer. And, uh, and, and, you know, the, the Seymour, my, my Seymour, in a sense, was the, the Women Action Forum, which, which had Shirkat Ga as a, as a branch in Lahore. And Shirkat Ga was, a, again, a, a, a think tank and a, and a, and a space where um, just young, young people like myself could gather and, and, and think and, and protest. And NCA, I had so many friends who were applying, you know, they used to have a drawing test to get in. Yeah, so that I will tell you <laughs> because what happened was that, you know, Seymour and Lala Rook were, Lala Rook was one of probably the founding members of WAF. So I was also very much um, gearing towards how I could be part of the Women Action Forum, you know, yeah, even okay. in its shadows, in some way as a young thinker, it was like, incredibly, um, it gave you a space yeah. to yes. really think and find like minded people and gravitate to a space, which was emblematic of women. And at that time, you know, Asma Jangir, one is looking at her. So this is a momentum that's happening, unfolding, and especially at the Canadian College for Women, right? It has its own institutional history. But do you, I have to tell you this anecdote, what they would do is they would lock the main entrance the door would get locked once we were in we couldn't exit and i have i i recall women climbing up the those you know fortress fortress like walls to to cross over to go over i think they would open the gate at at noon or something yeah, yeah. at that time also driving in the, individually independently to the college was a big deal I mean, it's, it's so difficult, sorry? The private public space starts to, you know, get incredibly gendered. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what, you know, and, that's what allows me to think about art is like, how do women intersect with art? Absolutely. And, and so it's private, private public, it's male, female, 
it's resistance conformity, right? The, the public sphere is conforming. It's conforming to the idea that the military dictatorship is asking us to do at the moment. And exactly as you were saying, you know, spaces like Shrikabha and Waf and, and Seymour, I mean, I remember this one small anecdote, and we'll, we, will, we will move on from it, but I remember must be 84 or 85 New Year's Eve. And it was at the house, and I, I don't remember the, the, the name of the um, professor. It was at the house of an NCA professor. And the whole thing was that he had this uh, place in Gulberg, and you could have a clandestine New Year's celebration. And there was nothing radical. I mean, is it not like there was some booze or some, some crazy disco dancing happening? It was just, you could recognize, you know, the turn of the year from, you know, the calendar year, uh, you know, Gregorian calendar year. And I remember um, being there at about 1130. It was about 13, 14 of us. And it got raided. It got raided by two cabs of police and, and Jamaat. And he, they dragged the professor out. I didn't know him directly. I was a guest of, of, of a guest and, and beat him in the street for simply hosting something. And so that was the space that we, we were confronted with as young people and to, to create art from that space of just shutting down uh, of having this literal wall as you're describing at Canard that you have to literally climb over in order to you know cross the jail road, <laughs> also called jail road. <laughs> Yeah, the college was on the road. But, you know, again, um, during my time at the National College of Arts, for about six months, the college gets shut down because the, there's protest from the Punjab University about the co-education nature of National College of Arts, right? So that always bothered. There was, I don't know, maybe 6% women at the, at the Punjab college, perhaps within the structure of, of art history or art. That's what I recall as a parallel, but there was always this obsession that why is NCA 50%, it often was like 49% yep. men and 51% women. So it was very egalitarian in that manner, right? So this is also unfolding that the school gets uh, shut down for more than six months on a strike. So we lose a whole year, yeah. which often created another issue like, oh, when did Shazia graduate? You know, so my graduation in, <laughs> in different books goes from 90 to 93. <laughs> There's never a consensus on when Shazia actually graduated. Should we put her in the 80s artist or should we put her in the new miniature 90s artist? So that, that also, I think, because the convocation of the yeah. college occurs even three years later after a graduation because they wanted Nawaz Sharif to come and host the con convocation so we could perhaps bring, you know, bring a little bit focus on, on the visual arts and hopefully get, get some resources. But so, yeah. so you know how, the, how <clears throat> military a decade and then post-military decade, things are still in, in utter chaos. Yeah, and you know, I think, Thinking back to that that time, I think one of the things that uh, is is you know as you said in your in your the earlier that you know it becomes what what is the question of gender what is the quite role of women not just in society but in art and art practice and how do we kind of think about that? I mean, I wanted I want to see if you want to show us a little bit of some of your some of your work that you might think uh, about that spec. But one of the things that um, I began thinking about Lahore, my own history in Lahore, Lahore's history, and I started to collect some stories. And I want us to kind of, I want us to talk about Lahore through some of these um, stories as well, because I think that these spaces of resistance, they are sometimes, you know, they're sometimes spaces like a NGO or a professor's home or a classroom or a practice. But they're sometimes also the mystical or or the you know unexplained or so I want to I, I want you to show a couple of things and then I want to have this conversation. Yeah, I do. Think, I think um, I definitely want to. Uh, it's very interesting your book where the wild frontiers are, 
when I was reading it, I, it was literally, I could open any page and I could align that with the drawing or painting I was making. Like I often think of my paintings as independent little poems or little, you know, notes or they are independent of each other. It's not like uh, the whole one type of work that just unfolds over time. Mm -hmm. So I I really appreciated the little um, sections and the titles in particular, mm -hmm. which I put a lot of emphasis on my titles too. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And um, I had, I'll, I'll go quickly over just, you know, some personal images <laughs> too. Aww. So that, that's also like a, a grand, like I, I grew up in a multi-generational, you know, household with all the uncles, aunts under, under the grandparents. So we all lived in one house. Where did and, you live? Uh, sorry? Where did you live? So this is in Gulberg near Main Market. Okay. And, um, and then my parents built a house in the backyard and my uncles built a back house in the backyard, another family. So eventually, you know, everybody got their little tiny house in, in the general, um, mm -hmm. under the grandparents' house. So this is me, wow. I guess in 1987 or six or seven or eight, I can't remember, but uh, this is also working on the scroll painting. Yeah. and which got a lot of attention so i was on the cover of the frontier post which i think doesn't exist anymore no, it does not exist <laughs> right so so that was all I, I, important important resistance newspaper very important resistance newspaper yeah so on the cover won many many awards so you know gravitating to miniature painting at the national college of arts i've had other opportunities to talk about it i'm sure it'll come up here and there but you know, I, I, I did study with Bashir Ahmed and learned the, the, the whole craft and copying and understanding through copying. And then my um, thesis was sort of a rupture and I, in scale and format and theme and bringing, inserting the personal and the feminine into the space. Yeah. And um, then I had a chance to engage with Bashir Ahmed uh, in like last year and the year before, especially because I have a retrospective of the 90s coming to um, to the US opening at the Morgan Museum mm -hmm. Library. And um, then the, you know, there's a big decade, two decades here before the, the image on a Frontier Post and the inaugural award with the State Department. <laughs> this is, um, so I wanted to just stop here for a second. I, in 2009, I did a film, sort of a film. I, I, was, I went to Abbottabad and recorded some, some original, I wanted to record the original music with the army's uh, music school. So it became Bending the Barrels and it took a long time before you know, they sort of detoured and shared some of their own compositions, but it was this patriotism which was being played around and and it could be any era it was it's 209 but it could really be the 80s also so there was this thing which i call bending the barrels and um and also i ended up having them play songs like jodhvi ka chand and these romantic ballads right so then the military playing those was a it was just a very kind of just this paradox of sorts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, just that sort of return to Pakistan, in, in, you know, again, one, one's always returning to Pakistan or one is always situated within Pakistan. And I've always had that struggle where, you know, where depending on whatever is in vogue or wherever the larger discussions are, especially like, events like 9-11, this that who is authentic and who gets to tell the story and who's operating from within the cultural authentic space. So that that thing has always been, I think, a, a big issue and trope in terms of, um, of uh, artists that um, 
that are perhaps transnational. I don't know if that's the right term. That term itself is problematic for me too. But so much of the iconographies that started to emerge early on were about the forms that were self-rooted so that yeah. they could carry. Let me, let me ask you something. You know, when you were when you were at NCA and you're you're thinking and learning, copying the miniatures, smuggle miniatures. What's striking to me is while you know whether it's through Bashir Ahmad uh, personally or through Lala Rukh and other kind of the ways in which the 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 Mughal miniature, you know, the narrative is that it you know it gets rediscovered. What's striking to me is that exactly at that time period, the actual Mughal period, the actual Mughal heritage is completely absent from Pakistan, right? So I and you presumably are reading textbooks in which it's Muhammad bin Qasim, who is the citizen of Pakistan. It's not Akbar, it's not Jahangir, it's not Babur. You know, Shah Jahan is nowhere to be found in a city that has his imprint. So it's, it's actually the Arab conquerors. So, and as a historian, I, 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 I must say that I cannot name a single historian of the Mughal period in Pakistan at that moment. Not a single one is writing Mughal history. So your state is not denying Mughal past because much of the Mughal history lies in partitioned, other part of the partition subcontinent. Your state is saying we are descendant of Arabs. We're not Mughals in ethnically or, or in ideologically. I wasn't taught any, any Mughal history as a, as a student. So where is the local, I mean, just to comp, you know, make complex this idea that you know, it's, it's only Pakistan and American, you know, like it's the Pakistani identity and the American identity that needs to be questioned. Um, how do we even think about the Mughal um, relationship with the Mughal history within Pakistan, right? Within Pakistan, you have a, in a city called Lahore, which is an important capital of the Mughal uh, empire at various points, you are, you are recovering it, not you, but you know, the generation, um, while it's absent elsewhere, right? So it's effaced like this in, in this, um, there's an effacement or a veiling um, and there's all of these other parts. So how do we even think about, what do you even, how was Mughal history or Mughal past explained to you as a student at NCA? What do you remember of, of, of that encounter with the, with, 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 with the Mughal history? Manan, absolutely what you're saying is so, so relevant because um, in my experience, it was so surface. Yeah. There was absolutely no understanding mm -hmm. of the Mughal history. Um, interestingly, right? Like one is studying miniature painting. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but so the references would be visual here right. and there. And that too, incredibly scattered. Mm just a couple of images because this is now pre-internet yeah it is it's all dependent on the four or five books in the library that are being recycled mm -hmm. and there are uh, there was no emphasis at that time to really uh, get into history or critical discourse and read about read it was just like paint that's yeah. what you're supposed to do learn the technique yeah. understandable but you know so this sort of this armature of really understanding simultaneously to what you're acquiring in your hand, how you acquire that knowledge in your mind was, uh, was there was a, uh, yeah, there was a diff sort of a, a, a gap there. And, um, and it would depend household to household, right? Like how much exposure you might have had through your family, through your parents, through the culture and the house, education, books, and you know that all of that. So that perhaps plays a role for uh, for our um, uh, generation in terms of how they recall this history. Like in my experience, there's a big gap, and and at the National College of Arts, there wasn't really um, focused subjects to really parse out the, the layers of, 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 uh, of Hindustan and, and the 
idea of that, even, you know, even continuing forward into the last so many, you know, years of, of engage, continuously engaging uh, with this, uh, with the archives, with the miniature painting visual archives, right? We, we are not necessarily talking uh, the way your current book, Hindustan, opens up the pre-colonial nature of it. I'm, I'm intuitively digging at it mm -hmm. for, for many years, <laughs> but, you know, there was never really a, 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 a clear path. Yeah, and, and think of, uh, you know, just to kind of, I mean, I love this, this particular ready to leave question mark. Um, because you see so many references in this in this uh, uh, painting of yours, where you can see that you know the 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 path backwards, as it were, to through past, is 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 kind of a um, building upon you know layers in a, in a palimpsest kind of fashion. And one of the ways in which you know academics love talking about palimpsest, I'm sorry to say, is like, you know, onions, right? You're peeling onion layers and it's translucent, yada, yada, and Walter Benjamin and all of those things, fine, okay. But one of the things is that they don't talk about the putting off on the layer of obfuscation, right? So how a state blinds us from our past, from our heritage, how our families in fact do so, right? Like my own family, which had a, a solid history of learning Persian, knowing Persian, um, goes from that history to saying, okay, you know, we may even not want to speak in Urdu. We are going to speak in Punjabi or the Lahori Punjabi that is, you know, uh, that, that was in the bazaar. So it's, it's the, 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 the putting up obfuscations on top of us, um, you know, so no way that you as a student or me as a student were able to learn anything about the history of Hindustan to, to think about our past. And one of the ways I, I want to say that I began thinking about this idea in Pakistan, in Lahore, is, is tied directly to this painting, which is this idea of Chalawa. Um, and Chalawa, why don't you tell me what Chalawa, because since it's there. <laughs> No, I know, Mana, it's just so, it's so exciting. But at the same time, you know, I, I am thinking like, why could we not have had this conversation in Chicago? <laughs> I know, right? Because think of the alternative worlds where we had this conversation in 97. Like if we lived in a system where histories were readily available, where it was easy to cite, where we were informed, we would not have lost so much time. Yeah. And that bothers me so much. And, and that sort of state of melancholy that I'm often in is what really is one of the reasons why I make art. And, and that's been sort of this degree of impairment for us mm -hmm. operating, not necessarily just this idea of operating in the West, I think even in Pakistan, there is a healthy yeah. level of impairment. So we, so that is also, I think, um, just a theme throughout the work that I make. Yeah. And you mentioned Chalava, right? The other day it came up and I was like, oh my God, I was making all this work around this idea of the Chalava. And that book, that Renaissance Society, at the University of Chicago published, actually the essay, the title I just realized was Chalava Clatch. No, really? The conversation with the Chalava. Oh. And, and the conversation of course is at that time, right? With Homi Baba. So we don't even talk about the Chalava. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he's kind of a Chalava-ish, but yeah. Right? yeah so totally. was, oh my God, it would, would how we should, we should have that conversation again yeah. you know, to, to to understand the missing gaps. Yeah, I but, mean, I wanna, I wanna just underline something you've just said, which really strikes me as incredibly important. Um, and it's so much a part of how I was thinking about my book about the loss of Hindustan, is what you're saying, right? This melancholy where you're removed from the knowledge, or you're removed from the past, you can't see, and you're making your art in order to kind of connect these dots 
and you know to stretch across these 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 spheres and i feel that so so much of looking at your work does that for me as a as a you know so you're making your art practice from that from a from that perspective but then when i'm looking as a as as i look at this that happens to me where i am seeing these connections these nodes that remain untethered being knit back together right and it's and the chalava became a story so chalava is this this figure that is a sometimes a personified as a woman um and as a as a woman that is enticing and uh, alluring and could um take a traveler on a dusky dusty road at night and evening really and uh, and rob him i rob him mostly of his of quote unquote vitality uh, <laughs> but also but also also his possessions um and and sometimes the chalava is 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 like a goat sometimes the chalava is like a, a cow a calf sometimes is you know it has this other mythic forms and the chalava i i remember collecting these stories in lahore and the chalava became a way that in in the transmorphic more transforming pers pers personas became a way to really encapsulate this idea of kind of different modalities that are connected right so the chalava will show up in a very matter of fact police report right like young man you know 6 pm sadar you know claims lost all his belongings woke up in a fever <laughs> was robbed by a chalava i read this report uh and so it's the police record but then it's like the the guy that i was talked to and he would say you know lahore used to have all these chalavas and then the military purchased all this land and built these colonies and now we don't have chalavas anymore and it's like that past that has just just vanished but here it is as in even it's vanished in in this ready to leave you you are able to see as an artist you're able to capture it so that someone like me can see it i mean it's really really powerful to kind of think about these issues right yeah and you know it's so like imagine this work is in the whitney's collection would they ever write about it in this manner never <laughs> we should send we should write and send it to them for their archives you know? right <laughs> well, uh, we, it, 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 that was the way i framed this painting yeah. it wasn't about me it wasn't about you know i'm like the muslim woman that has come to the west and then <laughs> and voila <laughs> you know we are opening up doors so that like the frustration of such a positions being thrust on one right yeah, so yeah. of course what i do here is that i play with this mythical notion of the chalava yeah. in my experience the chalava had been what i was recalling my grandmother uh, from my mother's side would often be like you know we wouldn't come and visit her enough <laughs> in and out so she was like she was like they are like we are like chalavas like yeah because they disappear both of them yeah and so that's what i recall that it was something that is so fleeting yes that, you know and and Hard to catch. Too, right and yeah. even and and how do you how do you capture that Yeah. and what i thought was like it's undoing would be this damn framework of the muslim woman <laughs> with the veil so i was like okay if i can play in a humorous manner maybe if it i can rip it apart and it becomes not literal but you yeah. know another way of playing with it then you pin it down you're going to pin down the chalava yeah this um with this very rigid interpretation or this relationship with the feminine and the yeah and and you know if and you're in your you're formally you're pinning it down here in this frame you know there's the circle and there's the frame right and the chalava intersects in those things i mean it's really it's it's quite quite amazing to see i i i you just showed it to me a couple of days ago you know i had never seen this painting before uh so, so that's why we need to have this conversation <laughs> i know okay <laughs> So so Shazia I I think we should uh we should turn to this 
amazing show, which I was really privileged to go see. I think you're either not the opening, but the day that you were you were present in the gallery. Um, and I walked down and I walked up and my brain was just on fire the whole time. Uh, it was just fascinating. So 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 walk us through and tell tell us tell us a little bit about it. And then we want to I want to talk about a few things specifically with you. Yes, so this current exhibition, uh, Weeping Willow's Liquid Tongue is, um, is on right now at the Sean Kelly Gallery in, in New York City till, um, till December 19th. It is a show that I ha have done in New York after several years. I have been exhibiting and showing and making work, but not necessarily in New York and mostly a little bit outside of the US and also doing you know, different public art projects I ha I was doing. So this show was giving me an opportunity to uh, showcase the last couple of direct years of directions. So that's how I ended up curating this particular exhibition. And uh, it also has my first sculpture that you can see promiscuous intimacies um, on the pedestal. So we may come to that too, but um, the, the parallax is another work which is showing in the piece. So that's um, that was done a couple of years ago, but still had never had a chance to show it in New York. Mm. So that's also showing it has traveled around the world in more than 20 countries. So that's also showing in the exhibition. Um, it has it has you know different languages coming through. I am thinking of the entire show as a, a, a kind of a homage to drawing. It's sort of like the libretto in the work because mm. it, it, it really is the genesis for all my uh, different directions that I collaborate with, whether collaborating with, say, you know, drawing and sculpture, drawing and mosaic, mosaic and the pixel in the animations and back again into the drawings and shifts in scale. So there's this sort of natural um, kind of kinetic zone that I think that the drawing allows me to be in just like I'm sure like thinking right like word like yeah. till you put them in some structure order they 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 can be placed in so many complex relationships yeah. so that's that's one way I, I I have worked there's another public artwork that I did at Princeton so you know even even the drawings are informed by um by engaging in multiple languages. And this work, um, Manan, that we were talking about, the X in <laughs> particular, uh, it's kind of literally engaged with, with language, with text, mm -hmm. but it also has so many more possibilities of interpretation. So, yeah, let's 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 linger at this for a second. Can you show the whole the whole piece? Yes. So the whole piece is in English and in Urdu, mm -hmm. and um, and yes, I do. Uh, it's got the references to Walib, so I'll come. Well, back it's, to that. I mean, not just references, right? So you say so you are playing with the not playing. You're using this couplet, right? Yeah. So tell me, tell me why you chose this particular couplet first, because I have an interpretation of it, which is I'm, I'm interested to see what you, you think of it. Well, um, how I, <laughs> my Urdu is really pretty bad, but how my interpretation was that what I've written in terms of the counter, right? Or it's, what do you call transliteration? But yeah. it's, it's, um, it says journey into irresolution. Yeah. So this idea of uh, the X is constantly moving. Yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. the target is always moving. And then the center is always moving. And I'm saying the center is right here, mm -hmm. as in, me as in the exhibition that I'm no longer interested in addressing the exhibition as the underrepresented narrative. I am the narrative mm. is that then mm. as an artist, I'm playing with the fact that, you know, the, uh, the work of an artist is never complete. Yeah. It just, 
the, the unfortunate or this the sort of the weight, the burden of that, that it, it's ongoing. So you will never have that um, satisfaction of consummation. It's just ongoing. And I think that ethos is very present in this particular puzzle. I, of, when, of, I was, uh, um, when I was in Europe, when I was in the physical gallery, um, just to tell everyone it masks and <laughs> masked and socially distant uh the i was looking at this and and you know one of the one of the first thing i i i was struck by is that so much of how the uh, western thought but also western art history uh, when it confronted um you know the the art practices from hindustan that they fetishized what Albert Said would call the arabesque, right? They fetishize the calligraphy. They fetishize how can these swirly languages with their, you know, sinewy alphabet intersect with each other and can be put in different rigid patterns. And what I loved about looking at this is like almost the way you've, you've juxtaposed that the words are both floating together and falling apart and kind of, you know, this blood red that kind of drips in and out. And so, in a way, you're kind of in this piece. What I saw as a as a viewer was that you were you were kind of pulling those sinews that inform you know the calligraphic out and disentangling the words. In fact, and and what what when when I when I leaned in and I read like the actual you know what the what the couplet is which is it's about the actual fleeting of life from the body as you enter this ecstatic mode and so Ghalib is talking literally about how you know that mode of transference where you're 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 figuratively and literally um breathing out and your life is escaping and and it was so beautiful that this tension that 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 you know our 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 bodies contain our our breath and here it was just exhaling or expanding or you know um bleeding out it was just so amazing to see and i spent a lot of time just looking at it. what you're saying is so you know like how you're interpreting i think is the first interpretation anybody has had in a in a in just understanding it in some tactile manner. I often, nobody will probably even talk about this work as you maybe I, I, like the, the, the focus on the show in the press and in general has been on one or two images, which are much more easy for people to yeah. digest. And, and here they will, they will not be able to understand perhaps because of that history of this fetishization yes. of language, right? Yes. And yes. that, okay, so that's not my burden. <laughs> why, why should I not embrace what I intuitively want to embrace? Absolutely. What am I performing for, right? Yeah. So like when I make certain such works, I get attacked from both sides. Yeah. Oh, you're playing to that idea of that fetishized zone. This yeah. idea of like, you know, how text is arabesque and all of that. Well, yeah. part of that has been <laughs> for many, many hundreds of years, part of the manuscript part the writing exists with the image and yeah. then also there, there's it's not decorative like when no no exactly. i mean that's that's exactly what said said right in the arabesque it becomes illumination decoration it becomes gobbly gook that is written on the side to make something look quote unquote islamic or oriental but I want to say one more thing about this image, which is um, this 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 painting X, which is that you know um, one of the things that I've I was method a lot you know to use a bad academic word methodology. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that I was very consciously doing in my book was that I was saying how do we think about the past of Hindustan without losing sight of the colonial heritage without losing sight of what the colony does to the post-colony. And again, you know, Ghalib is such a perfect example because Ghalib is both tied to the Mughal state as a teacher of Bahadur Shah, Zafar, but he's also has to 
post-1857 draw pension from the colonial state. And so he has to figure out how to write in English. He has to figure out how to write in English when he has Persian and Arabic, I mean, Persian and Urdu as his main. So when you write in English across this, as you see, you can see like, you know, little snippets in the bottom half and maybe also in the top half. First of all, the scale of this is amazing. I was, I was just like, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly the ways in which the colonial languages, the Persian, the Urdu, the worlds have been kind of, that's the moment of, of this, you know, in, in, in the same couplet that he says, you know, that you've taken this from, uh, this, this, uh, this poem that you've taken this couplet from. He has this other, other line, which is, um, mm-hmm. How is that we have now been debased um, in this world that, you know, um, that this debasement has come. And he's, he's talking about love, I guess, but he's, I think, also talking about the colonial state. So that's why I, I think this is such an, such an amazing, amazing piece of work. So beautiful. No, I, I'm so appreciative of your insight into it from all these perspectives, because I think all of that is informing me because again, of how, where we are coming from, yeah. who we are, right? It's, we both grew up in Pakistan and then that, that, that we carry that. And yeah. that is the sort of the DNA in my work. Yes. And, and it, what, what is the incredible loss is that nobody talks about the work through that lens. Mm-hmm. And, and hopefully, you know, we, we can generate more conversation around this topic itself. Um, so let's uh, let's look at a couple more. Um, uh, you want to show us a little bit more? I know yeah. So I, I was going to share just a quickly that you know I, I was in Sharjah when I was uh, working on. Um, eventually, parallax comes about through that opportunity. But when I was doing research, I came across the cinema, and I was like, it reminded me of so many architectures and in yeah there's, there's alfala cinema in lahore exact same yeah. exact so same like, oh my God, it's like so familiar so i need to go and check it and then came it was it was abandoned well mm-hmm. whatever that means it over there in that <laughs> context of abandonment but it was it wasn't functional and the person who i who was the caretaker the person who was living there was actually from pakistan who had come to build it as the oh. labor in 1976. So he was, he, he was, his visa was still attached to the architecture. Wow. And I meet him in 2012. And then I, I, he's shocked. What's a Pakistani at the door doing? And I'm like, what are you doing here? And then he is living there and the place has holes and, you know, pigeon dropping that's toxic in many kind of metaphorically and in the, the physically ways and so I spend like a week and get to know him and and I stage the last show for the caretaker so to speak but it gave me ideas of what I wanted to do with parallax so mm-hmm. here also is a reference to Walib yes. yeah. and so then I was thinking again you know what is our what where where even in a transient sort of lives where you know I have this freedom and mobility uh, but I'm still at that time in 2013 traveling on a Pakistani passport and visas are hard and all of that right and then he's there with his link the captive to that architecture but then he lives there that's his home he's been there since 1976 who am I to judge how what what is labor of love there right so then this idea of freedom becomes really um, fleeting and difficult to grasp. So that's so th- that's sort of this piece that came about. What what is his name? Yeah. So he didn't want to share, you know, for political reasons and all. Of course, of course. That's why I didn't put him like yeah. his face yeah. is not part. And then it also like while I was doing the photos in this thing, you know, it reminded me again of Mahmoud Darvesh. Mm. I this I want to see it in the abandoned theater, right? That yeah. Time. Yeah, so yeah. It, it so they so then 
that's how, that's another sort of way I work is that one thing kind of you know leads into another and all of these layers start to speak to each other so um yeah so like just sharing a little bit of again you know works where I've played with language and and the form itself but again it's never decorative even the one on the right yeah. engages with the word murder murdered murderer that yeah. is another topic for another day but you know, it it it's like for me i was imagining it as a ball of barbed wire yeah but it uses it uses hebrew it uses arabic and then the rustam and surab idea like a portrait which which is abstract but here the text is also referencing the poem but the cyclical nature of father son the violence the the nature of the epic poem mm -hmm. and these paintings are large but also this repetition you know wrote the, the 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 way wrote emerges yeah in, in our consciousness and practice and there's an the, so so Ghalib kind of continues in the show the third one also references Ghalib here too and you know Ghalib being you know uh, i i i'm going to conjecture that you were in lahore when uh, gulzar's ghalib was on television and doordarshan did you see it did you watch the series yeah, so. <laughs> yes right like i think for our generation the introduction to ghalib was through through gulzar through this Absolutely, through gulzar yes yeah. and so we're watching ghalib and and then i remember um, just like even those tapes you know playing in the background when one yeah. is painting in pakistan yeah. Yeah, and then you know, I remember asking my amma, "Okay, you know, I need, I want, I want a, a copy of the Divan," and and my my mother, you know, at that point she had just started. We had just started reading uh, Faz's um, Daste Saba, mm -hmm. and you know, so she was like, "Well, you know, Faz talks a lot about Ghalib, so maybe you're right. We should have read the Divan before we started reading Faz." And then, so we started reading Ghalib together. It was just one of the things, again, that connected me to, you know, my mother, but also to kind of this, this, these dreams and these, these worlds that are just not there. Um, I mean, amazing, right? Right, right, absolutely. Like, yeah, so there's so many ways, right, that the, that he, that Ghalib has continues to fascinate people and then scholars themselves there's so many vantage points there's so many tensions around who gets to um articulate and bring meaning out of Ghalib so me as a novice I'm like just interested in 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 my my sort of intimate connection to that which is which is which goes back to Lahore I mean this is what I'm trying to say that I think it's our generation in Lahore watching Doordarshan, listening to those Jagjit and uh, what was her, what was the name of the, uh, the couple, right? Like yeah, uh, Jagjit and Chitra. Chitra. Yes, Jagjit and Chitra's uh, these yeah. tapes, these yeah. and audio tapes, these TDK, TDK, TDK <laughs> tapes. Um, I think we had this. I don't think Karachi, because Karachi, you couldn't get Doordarshan. I don't think Islamabad would get Doordarshan. I think you and I, or our generation in Lahore, who could pick up, whose television stations could pick up Doordarshan, could see Gulzar's Ghalib, and then had those tapes. And so it entered us in a particular way that it does not enter, I kid you not, have this conversation with someone in Karachi. Yeah. And you will not see Ghalib. No, I don't know. I don't actually know any other artist who uses Ghalib. Ghalib, right? So I often get asked, like, why Ghalib, right? right. And, and part of, and you perhaps this is it. This is this it. Is it's it. there. And you know what? It's also like I remember uh, re just playing um, uh, Iqbal also. Yeah, yeah. Iqbal and Jawabi Shikwa. Yeah, yeah. You know, that for me was like playing when I was making the scroll painting because yeah. it was such a great rupture. Yeah. The ability to take ownership. I'm going to converse. <laughs> I'm going to converse with history. I'm going to converse with God. It's like, you know, so it comes back to that melancholic yes. area of like how our consciousness is shaped in the Ziaz regime, right? Yes, absolutely. That, that becomes really instrumental and continues to move forward. But then again, it's also what is so... Um, 
difficult is that how do you, um, or maybe you don't need to gather in a linear fashion, right? We are trained to think in such linearities that I was like, okay, I, I, I go back. Why should I be punished for going backward before I move forward, right? Yeah. So this yeah. idea of tradition becomes this unspoken, sometimes like this too, too big a burden that, that why are you doing that? You should not be, you should be more contemporary. Your work is, I've often been asked by Pakistani artists, your work is not contemporary. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, I think I think that you know the obviously I I spend my days and nights thinking about this 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 past and time and you know why and how we have to move back and I think one of the things if you can go back for a second I know we're talking about your installation but if you can go back to the cinema that one shot you had with the posters um, with with the Darwish that you mentioned um, I mean if we just look at this image that you have I mean not just the 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 dust that the the frozenness in time of this this place but the the posters right hum kisi se kam nahi koi mere dil se puche these ishq rishta these these incredibly important movies that that shape a public so the public is still there in that poster the public is still waiting right so this is not past this is not future and this is certainly not the present and so I think in, in many ways, your art is doing precisely that. It's not moving linearly in a linear fashion, you know, past and present and future. Like I think what you're doing and what I sometimes try to do in my writing is precisely to say that we are not, time is not linear as the Western epistemic kind of forces upon us. We can actually converse with Ghalib in an empty theater, like Darwish says, I want to sit in an abandoned theater, cinema, exactly, because the past has is constantly speaking with us and through us. And we are constantly trying to build a better future as a result of that, uh, that conversation, right? And I think it's such a, this image precisely, but your work is such a reminder to me that, that we cannot, simply let the past be hostage to those who want to create more more violence in our present because they are the ones i mean what is today today is december 6th as we're speaking right so today is when a mughal uh, masjid was demolished in babri masjid was demolished in ayodhya in december 6 1992 so that's a claim to the past. That's a claim that says that, you know, this, this mosque must be demolished in order to uh, create, a, a, you know, a, a place for Ram to be worshipped. And the, that act of possessing the past is what I think your work, certainly my, my hope is that we get to interrupt um, Walter Benjamin, who I, you know, who I mentioned, you know, had this had this line as he was he was himself trying to resist the Nazi regimes, was that you know the dead are not safe, right? The dead are not safe from from those who who are going to claim the past. It's, it doesn't matter that this that this this Babri Masjid is in the past and Babur is in the past, or they're still they're still there. So this is such such a powerful part of your work that that I feel like you know um, needs to be articulated at least for myself so I can understand your work better. No, oh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I can't tell you like how um, just this just this conversation for me is incredibly generative. It's giving me so many new ways of of looking at my work itself. And, you know, and I, I, and I think as a visual artist, it, it, so much of it is intuitive. Yeah. But it's not divorced from a conversation that you are having with, with in your work, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that oftentimes you are, a, you're, in, you're, the, you're the historian and, you know, the art, art maybe it, they want me, I, my, somebody writing about my work has to be the art historian. <laughs> right. 
right? So there, there's this sort of separation right there. And why not? Because I think that's where we need to really uh, have a discourse that allows conversations across disciplines. Yeah, yeah. And that's incredibly important, I think, especially for Asian, like for, for, for us as Desis, because these silos are what I have, what often depress me. <laughs> Maybe which is one of the reasons why I wasn't that excited to do a show in New York for the last eight, nine years, right? Was that, it, that where, I don't, who are you making the work for? Yeah. Sometimes you forget, right? The work hopefully can exist over time, but at that time, as an individual, it, these, are, these are such um, important ways of, of and, having conversations around that that would be the work. And then I, I want us to, I guess we should, we should start thinking about wrapping up, but I want us to kind of, I want us to talk a little bit about this idea of how you've been written about, um, mainly because, you know, just, just, you know, just in trying to kind of think about our conversation today, um, I looked up some of the ways in which, you know, the press has written about you. Oh, and I this I'm, I hope this is not triggering, but <laughs> I'm gonna read a little bit, a little footnote uh, from. I guess this is from 2001, uh, and this this white white art critic or art historian. I don't know who he is. I didn't I didn't bother looking him up, but this is how he 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 writes about your work. He says, "Sure." You're gonna see what the what the work the word sure does here. Sure, the painter Shazia Sikander, born and raised in Pakistan, manages to flip the script on the whole history of Indian miniatures, but to position her as an artist throwing off the oppressive yoke of male patriarchy, Islamic censorship, or the pervasive Western fantasy of South Asian culture as simply some kind of prohibited version of footloose, does a disservice to her work. <laughs> And, you know, I was just reading this and I was like, the way that you, I mean, obviously 9-11 shapes, shapes my work in terms of the types of histories I write, obviously it has an impact on you, but the ways in which the, the American press wants to claim you for doing different kinds of things, right? Like, oh, you know, not being Taliban, <laughs> or be, you know, whatever this insane review said. Um, must have been a burden that, you know, I just want you to talk a little bit about that struggle that you faced over the years, um, being spoken about, written about in a particular fashion. Um, you know, just share some of your thoughts on that. I'm just really curious to hear a little bit more about it. So, um, I, um, yeah, Manan, this is, um, this is really, it definitely has been can trigger me in the past, but I think I feel- <laughs> I didn't want to trigger you. <laughs> I do feel fueled right now with the recent, you know, having put an exhibition up. So I've been tapping into that zone for a while for the last few years and using my frustration to create work again. And in that sense, I feel really blessed that, you know, one has, one has art and creativity to use as fodder, but I, I, it is, it is very, very difficult that yeah. when all this sort of nuance that one is exploring and engaged with and who we are, we are such complex notions of, you know, of, of, um, as creative thinkers mm -hmm. and how some of that completely gets erased, not once or twice consistently. And that, that for me is, um, is really upsetting because even when, you know, coming to the US, you come and you're within a year or two or three, it was pretty clear that it was a black and white narrative and being in between all of that, there's a level of great invisibility and perhaps opportunity for new conversations, right? So there's this constant sort of, between being in between yes. pendulums and, and which for me was about breaking the binary. Mm -hmm. Like the work, work automatically was aware of the binaries, but it was going to take on 
as many and as often. And so that's sort of where the work sits. It sits between multiple spaces and, mm -hmm. and offers precision, but open-ended narratives also. Mm. That that's that that's how I was. Um, uh, that's how I wanted to sort of talk about perhaps this one painting, because Gayatri Gopinath wrote something which I thought was again different from its interpretation. It must be this is done in two thousand and one, and I think in some art history books, it basically talks about again um, me fleeing Pakistan or this idea of Muslim mm. case and coming to the West for freedom or some, some kind of sentence or two around that that situates it in this place. So she talks about it. The representation of gendered bodies takes on a particular valence in the context of imperial war and carnage at the start of Bush's war on terror. It is worth recalling that the initial human rights justification for the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 was to, quote, unquote, save Muslim women from Islamic extremism. Pleasure Pillars speaks back to such paternalistic and fetishized gendered discourses and insists on revivifying submerged and forgotten narratives, genealogies, and traditions of pleasurable, sensuous, and joyous gendered embodiments. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, perhaps that, that was intuitively what I was aiming for, but maybe, none of that um, language would ever been applied on that work. Mm. So we're talking fast forward 20 years before somebody else comes along and mm. writes about it. So, but in that period of, of those 15, 20 years, this, this particular work has operated on many other levels <laughs> and in books and here and there. So already it has been erased. It has been written about in ways that I cannot control anymore, or yeah. I couldn't, so I made the painting. So that, that, that kind of constant, um, whatever you call it, catastrophe of sorts, that, that sort of, I feel like it's an assault on my senses, assault on who I am, is, um, it, it gets really dif difficult and reductive. And, you know, there was another piece here so then, I then when I think of it, I often think of the stalemate. So I, I so all of this will allow me to think, you know, in in visual ways where I'm playing on how I'm feeling and how I want the paintings to feel, the visceral nature of experiencing the ink and paint, the gouache, the scaling up as you saw in the X, like that's almost a ten foot work. Yeah, body becomes part of the experience. So it's. So, it, so, you know, some of that sort of starts going into these large scale projections right into space. So this idea of, 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 uh, of the frame as being constantly, it's yeah. almost non-present. What is it? What is making this image is just light. I love, I love, uh, I love what you're saying right now. I, I just want to. I guess underline is again just to say what I'm hearing back to you, because you know, as someone who's being deliberately put into these frames, right? Like within the page of the newspaper where your, you know, your your piece, which I I have reading of it, I can I can I would like to like to share it with you, but to to kind of blow it up, right? To say, look, where is the frame now, right? How do you how do you encapsulate? This installation, which is you know in 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 space, in time, and in, in, in on on the material world, on these trees, and and it's it's just beautiful and amazing, and such a such a such a deliberate and creative response to what the ways in which you've been bracketed. But if can we go back to that uh, image for a second? Um, the the painting itself. The painting itself, yeah. I mean, you know, if if I look when I look at this, I mean, obviously, not as an art historian, um, not someone who's. I mean, although I can pick all of the all of the references, there's there's the there's the Jahangir album, there's the you know there's the there's the Shah Jahan album. I mean, I can get all that stuff done, but um, the 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 centrality 
of the of the uh, I guess the bomber, the plane, uh, which is also the centrality of the calligraphic center of the folio page, right? Where you have the the the, the kind of image. Um, you know what this reminds me of? If I can be, if I can, if I can just say it, it it's it's not not kind of thinking of the many faces or whatever that headline said of Islam or whatever. But this is like you literally climbing over that Khmer wall. And, you know, like you're literally going over the wall of Khmer College and, and crossing that road, right? So this is transgression in what, what Foucault and et cetera would talk, call, you know, this is transgressive art. This is what the radicalness of it is, is that the act that you as an artist are doing you're climbing over that wall and saying like, I can actually go over. And that wall represents not just the kind of ways in which the West is looking, but also the ways in which the, the art practice is looking at you, right? Like not just the West looking at the world, but the art world looking at you. I mean, this is such a, such a to me, such a deliberate kind of idea of, of, of overrunning boundaries and as when you were speaking about the installation pieces right which is in 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 space saying where is the frame now then i'm like yeah that's exactly what is happening like you are saying where is the frame now and you're saying it here and you're saying is there so it, it it makes perfect sense as you have narrated in the, in the series of these these uh these few paintings um anyways that's all i have to say about that um, so Shazia, I think we should, we should, we should wrap up. Uh, so I have one last question and then I think we, we want to, we want to, uh, finish the conversation. I, I guess I, at the end, we've talked about your process and how you're kind of thinking about, you know, what, what happens to you as an, and what happens to you as an artist, what happens to you as a citizen, how you experience things and then how the art is it a type of kind of response that's happening? But one thing that you're doing, which I think is quite amazing, is you're, you're learning, or I don't know if learning is the right word, but you're kind of creating so many new ways to think with you know different forms. I mean, the sculpture was so amazing. So just talk a little bit about your, about, I guess, your process of how and what you continue to kind of you know climb those walls. <laughs> Those Kinnear College walls. I mean, I think my the theme of this show is going to be Lahore because you know that's where it is. Yeah, um, language is so critical in so many ways in this exhibition, in the process, in thinking, but also thinking at the loss that I I feel like I think earlier we talked about you know how families in in the eighties in my experience in your experience also enforced a certain type of language over the other like in our household we were we nobody taught me how to speak Punjabi mm. and and I it's just so such a burden now that I wish I could speak Punjabi because the, if you're not fluent in Punjabi there's no need to speak it <laughs> <laughs> right it's one of those languages right so my mother's um, um, natural tongue her tongue is very much Punjabi and I think the emphasis was always on India, English medium schooling and speaking in English and going to a Catholic school at that time, the convent, all of that. So that's also, you know, this negotiation between different languages yes. that's going on. And so it's informed one's um, process from a very early age. And that's how I often think of, of of my work but in particular this exhibition when you're standing in that place you can hear the urdu unfolding in dis uh, in disruption as rupture and there's um the new piece is in a colloquial baltic region area it's almost it's turkish um uh, uh zebungish singing that then parallax you can hear sound sound of parallax coming from under and that's all in colloquial uh, classical and colloquial Arabic. So mm. that was also kind of intentional that orally you're transported in multiple languages. And then you have the, you know, like mosaic, sculpture, small drawings, large drawings, but they all are um, 
incredibly linked and linked through through the relationship of forms and scale and languages, but also linked through this attention to detail and craft and material, transformation of materials. And uh, this this work, I, I recall this work you you liked in particular, right? This and is my favorite. This is my favorite. Yes. So even here, you know, this would it's hard to share that in in a virtual place because when you come up close, you can see that nothing is grouted some forms yeah. sit outside it there's like these unexpected uh relationships between material and then also these two particular forms somebody the other day was asking me what is this sort of you know this sort of form which is is it the ghost and yeah. then I'm like, well, actually that's an interesting way to think of it that it's the spirit that kind of um runs through through the work itself but um, even referencing, you know, Golconda or like some of the styles that there, that are there, those have become um, um, templates of sorts. Mm -hmm. So how do you activate motifs? How do you how do you create ownership with them? And that and that that really is something that I constantly think about in terms of if I'm looking at the archives, if I'm studying something. And then, you know, how do I create my own bridge to that? Mm -hmm. It can be as simple as like, I'm just going to appropriate it. It has to have, I have to digest it. I have to regurgitate it. I got to, I got to fight with it. I have to, I have to be honest about that process. And in that, in that space, you know, I, I have to let whatever is going to emerge out. And, and that's, that's how I think of, of, of uh, the relationship between languages themselves. Like this too, for me, is like the mosaic. Yeah. But here again, the reference is so much to the Islamic geometry, right? And then again, the, the, the nature of the female that runs through the entire show is, you can, you can again, come at it from many ways. I, I think of it really as, as, a, as a place of, of uh, injecting, questioning social justice questioning you know the 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 expunging of the feminine yes from historical narratives in yes. particular and obviously like even miniature painting like i don't know a single um uh painting ever being a given you know uh, being authored or being kind of that that a female painted that uh, how is that possible there must have been female miniature painters absolutely there were yeah so, so, you know, so that sort of that gendered zone, like here, the Mughal court gets, you know, I accumulated with the women, then I remove the bodies, then the hair remains, is the, is the hair intact? What is the, what can I do with it? Can it be choreographed? And I think of particle systems. And so there's so many ways in which, um, in which one as a, as a, as a, artists can the freedoms that I can take so that for me the art becomes your home it becomes the space of of, of it, the authentic space the idea of so it's no longer about geography it's very much about history right absolutely I think it's about history I think it's exactly as you're saying it's about the 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 emphasis that you as a creative professional are putting on the question of the feminine self the feminine soul the feminine body, the idea of thinking about this world from that perspective and centering it and ghosting it and, and you know, removing the, 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 the lights that are shined or not shined. I mean, I think that's, the, you know, the relationship that a historian has to an archive when we and I think about that in my own work is always that the archive becomes a space for us to um, go in order to think about the past in a particular way and to you know say to our audience like hey look i went to the archive and i found this particular interesting important um piece of information and i'm going to present it to you and what what an artist like such as like yourself or a, a writer um who is thinking in these radical and these um you know transformative transgressive ways can do is not just 
um, bring that piece of information, bring that 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 beautiful or 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 demonic presence back, but change it, modify it, think about it, you know, make it link to worlds that no longer exist, as as in as in the sculpture, the sculpture that you you created. And I think that power of where the archive is not a stable entity only available to the privileged, right? Like think about like your pa you mentioned your passport, right? Earlier when you you were traveling on a Pakistani passport, you know, I have a Pakistani passport. I cannot go to India. I cannot go to visa free to, you know, EU or whatever. And that is actually my relationship to the archive because the archive is in those places and I can't get to it. It's not just the political world, it's actually the archival world. And so in, in, in a work like yourselves, you can actually see how the archives are decentered and, and made malleable and made you know, recast, to use the sculpture term, right? Recast um, in, in, in these beautiful forms that are, are you know, again, are, are extremely transgressive and extremely at home at the same time like you feel like yes this is a this is a work that uh speaks to me in my immediacy now so um yeah i uh, yeah i i just want to add that your this inability to access the archives it, it, even in in our times like right now in this digital age it is incredibly prevalent yeah, I cannot. I I think I've applied to get the Indian visa a few times in the last few years. Yeah, I haven't been able to get it. Right. And you know, none of the institutions will ever share digitally. That's another difficult yeah. Uh, yeah. story about the archive. But so most of the material exists in people's homes in storages that will never we will never access till we actually. If one knew somebody and then you happen to physically be present there. So to let go of that entire space was yes. one of the harshest, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, realities for me. I had for a long, long time wanted to uh, be able to be in India many times to really work work there if not necessarily live there but at least live there for a, for a few weeks at a time and develop the intimacy that is projected onto the work so when you come to a place like outside of south asia right and then all of a sudden you have to perform as this south asian yes and then in that South Asian, you are speaking for the Indian, you're speaking for the Bangladeshi, you're speaking for the Pakistani, and you got, all got to be happy, right? Then, but that's so not, that, that remove, just that sort of blurs the whole thing. Yes. Because there is not, that intimacy is not there. And it's not possible, politically not possible, right? Like that's the issue, is that, that the loss of Hindustan, as I was, I was arguing, was that, you, you we, it's not that you cannot access it because you're alien to the past is because you cannot access it because you're alien to the political state right like there's no there like you could be in bengal looking at kalighat paintings and and reproducing them and thinking with them but you cannot be in bengal that's the issue that's the that's my issue that's your issue and i think that as artists or as writers or as historians I think that liminal space that the politics in, in, you know puts on on us, pushing us to the margin um, of 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 these these worlds, is is something that you know I think I struggle with immensely. And you know, as I'm hearing you, you as well um, um, are struggling with that or struggling with what 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 it means for your work. So Shazia, I I must say this has been an absolute pleasure talking to you um, just my my mind is kind of filled of all these stories that i wish we we, we had more time now to to continue and, and talk and I'm, I'm sure we will get more um more more time together to think about these issues i think the the effort here today was as i mentioned at the beginning 
is to is to kind of pair two radical thinkers and have them talk about their works and and think with each other and that's certainly what we did today i i, I feel like i've actually you know just had the privilege of thinking with you in a, in a very very profound way and i'm i'm grateful for that i'm really grateful for that um and uh, at aaww uh, with uh, with with their with the amazing amazing uh, kind of efforts that they have to think about issues important issues in the public sphere to think about these silos between the academy and the non academy or between art practices and and art viewing um, have to be broken down in certain ways and this series is really a a, a way in which we're uh, thinking about um, opening up spaces and so we are we are um, we have planned and we'll have a season's worth of shows uh, conversations that you will see uh, in forthcoming from this uh, inauguration uh, effort and uh, please uh, please uh, please watch this show and then watch all of the other shows please contribute your own thoughts um, build first identify the wall of Canadian College and then climb over it as Shazia has done. Um, so Shazia, last words to you. My, my thanks to you and then last words to you. Manan, this has been absolutely just joyous. I, I can't tell you how happy I am that you invited me and that you had such incredible things to share. I wish I had I had I have so many questions that I wanted to ask you about your both your books. So we should definitely, if we can, do a part two of this. <laughs> but um, really, it's it's uh, it's very important that we have such conversations, and um, you know, I I look forward to this series. I think I, I am very grateful to AAWW for giving their time and space and resources for this. It's it, it's such an amazing organization doing such an amazing work. It's really I'll I'll end by saying that you know when I moved to New York uh, in 2012, um, the one part of New York that I had known was my home before I moved to New York was AAWW just because I had been part of their extended remote family for so long and actually the book that you cited the 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 where the vile frontiers are had its uh, had its debut or its 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 first showing was at at aww so thank you to aww thank you to jafreen thank you to lily and thank you to shazia and see you all <laughs>